The authorities in the Spanish city of Barcelona say 13 people have been killed and 80 injured by a van, which deliberately drove into them at a popular tourist market. The vehicle moved at speed through Las Ramblas in the city centre, before being abandoned by the driver who ran away. Hundreds of tourists and local people took shelter in shops and churches as police searched for suspects. Hours later, two of them, including a man of Moroccan origin, were arrested. Spanish media say another suspect was killed in a police shootout on the outskirts of the city. The Spanish Prime Minister, Mariana Rajoy, who's, in, who's on his way to Barcelona, says he'll be coordinating efforts to reinforce security, while the Catalan president, Carles Puigdemont, has called for solidarity. First, though, the U.S. government has released its monthly jobs report. It's one measure of how the economy as a whole is doing. The report that just came out is for the month of September, and it was a disappointment. Economists had expected that 479,000 jobs would have been added last month. The actual number was well below half that, according to the U.S. Labor Department. It was the second month in a row that the number of jobs added to the American economy was dramatically lower than what economists predicted, and no one knows exactly why the growth in this area has slowed down. Many economists point to continued concerns about the coronavirus pandemic and the Delta variant of the disease. The Venezuelan authorities say they have suppressed what they termed a terrorist attack on an army base in the city of Valencia. Diosdado Cabello of the governing United Socialist Party said loyal troops re-established security at the base. Officials said seven people had been arrested and at least one of them died. Afghan officials say at least 50 people, including women and children, have been killed by militants in the northern province of Saripul. A spokesman told the BBC that insurgents attacked security checkpoints and entered a village, killing civilians, among them women and children. He said Taliban and Islamic State fighters were involved. The Taliban has denied killing civilians. They say they killed 28 members of a local militia.
When density is high enough our natural reaction to the closeness of all those vehicles behind us is to slow down. This reduces the flow and speed and increases the density, which can cause even more slowness. Eventually, the whole thing grinds down to a low speed. Density is increased by people joining a road from on ramps, and this causes vehicles to slow down. Therefore people are generally bad at merging speed. Then some people who have been held up in the left-hand lane move to the middle lane which causes the same problem in the middle lane. Traffic backs up. Then some people die from the middle lane into the overtaking lane and that slows down. It is difficult to know how to place Montesquieu if you're the kind of person who likes to categorize historian, political philosopher, sociologist, jurist, or if you think the Persian letters a novel, a novelist. He was all these things. Perhaps, as some have, he could be placed among that almost extinct species, the man of letters. The books that make up the spirit of the laws have had the most influence on later thinkers, and in them, as in his equally great considerations on the causes of the grandeur and decadence of the Romans, he makes his underlying purpose clear. It is to make the random, apparently meaningless variety of events understandable. He wanted to find out what the historical truth was. His starting point, then, was this almost endless variety of morals, customs, ideas, laws and institutions, and to make some sense out of them. He believed it was not chance that ruled the world, and that beyond the chaos of accidents, there must be underlying causes that account for the apparent madness of things. These two paintings, both called sunflowers, are generally accepted as the finest of several depictions of the thick-stemmed, nodding blooms that Van Gogh made in 1888 and 1889 during his time in Arles. The first is now in the collection of the National Gallery in London, and the second is in the Van Gogh Museum in Amsterdam. Van Gogh referred to this work as a repetition of the London painting. But art historians and curators have long been curious to know how different this repetition is from the first. Should it be considered a copy, an independent artwork, or something in between? An extensive research project conducted over the past three years by conservation experts at both the National Gallery and the Van Gogh Museum has concluded that the second painting was not intended as an exact copy of the original example, said Ella Hendricks, a professor of conservation and restoration at the University of Amsterdam, who was the lead researcher on the project.
Rebuilding carbon-rich agriculture soils is the only real productive, permanent solution to taking excess carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. She's frustrated that scientists and politicians don't see the same opportunities she sees. This year Australia will emit just over 600 million tonnes of carbon. We can sequester 685 million tonnes of carbon by increasing soil carbon by half a percent on only 2% of the farms. If we increased it on all of the farms, we could sequester the whole world's emissions of carbon. Working together, they figured out that if the government was going to propose some kinds of significant tax increases, which is a good strategy require me to at least lie something like getting something for those big tax brackets, not seeing any results. So the result of that was in the package of legislation that included the tax increases. There was awesome information to have a significant expansion of coverage families where they can buy into their private insurance. As a consumer, you're probably consuming imports. If we have a trade war and we start slapping tariffs on all of those imports, the bill is going to be higher. If the world relies so much on trade, what is a trade war and why do countries get caught up in them in the first place? The first step is to fill your primary fermenter with 22 liters of water and mark the level using a marker. Then, sanitize your fermenter along with the spoon thermometer and a hydrometer. Add 1.8 liters of warm water to the fermenter and stir in bentonite, which will aid you in clarifying the wine. Afterwards, pour the grape juice into the fermenter with the bentonite solution. Add 3.7 liters of warm water to the bag in order to get rid of any remaining juice and add it to the fermenter. To continue, top up the fermenter to the 22 liter mark with lukewarm water. Stir energetically for 30 seconds. Draw a sample of the juice and take a hydrometer reading.
Many different types of barcode scanning machines exist, but they all work on the same fundamental principles. They all use the intensity of light reflected from a series of black and white stripes to tell a computer what code it is seeing white stripes reflect light very well, while black stripes reflect hardly any light at all. The barcode scanner shines light sequentially across a barcode, simultaneously detecting and recording the pattern of reflected and non-reflected light. The scanner then translates this pattern into an electrical signal that the computer can understand. All scanners must include computer software to interpret the barcode once it's been entered. This simple principle has transformed the way we are able to manipulate data and the way in which many businesses handle recordkeeping. You just bought peanut butter. You chose the jar because, well, you've always eaten the crunchy variety. In reality, however, something else may have influenced your choice. The product you picked was centrally located on the store shelves. Researchers tracked the eye movements of 67 subjects as they scanned a 3 by 3 matrix of fictitious brands. The tracking found that consumers tend to focus on objects in the middle, specifically five seconds before they made their choice. And they did this for all kinds of products, from vitamins to online movies. Also, subjects continued to go for the centrally located brand, even if the product was not in the middle of their specific visual field. So it's not in reference to one's view. It is literally about the product being central within the entire shelf layout. Past studies have shown that people tend to make a lot of choices based on central locations, like choosing the middle bathroom stall in a public washroom, a middle seat at a table, or even the middle items in a series of arbitrary objects. The test consumers had no conscious awareness that they had chosen centrally located brands. Makes you wonder what you've taken home without realizing why. Birds face many man-made mortal threats. Windows, cats, habitat destruction, even climate change. And now there's poison in their bird seed. You see, the Scots miracle Grow company had been in the habit of applying banned pesticides to its wild bird food products. In particular, the company applied a chemical known as Storeside 2 to its bird food, despite a warning label for that product that reads, quote, Storeside 2 is extremely toxic to fish and toxic to birds and other wildlife. Why add a compound toxic to birds, to food meant to be eaten by birds? Because Scott didn't want bugs infesting its bird food during storage. 
By the time Scott stopped adding the pesticide in March 2008, the company had sold some 70 million bags of adulterated bird food. The company also submitted false documents to the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency, distributed pesticides with misleading labels, and distributed illegal pesticides. As a result, the EPA slapped the company with a $12.5 million in criminal fines and civil penalties. So when you put out new bird seed this winter, at least you won't be inadvertently poisoning any chirpers. Oh, and keep those cats inside, too. Here's one way bats might get their next meal, by eavesdropping on flies having sex. Bats eat a lot of seemingly undetectable flies. To find out how the winged mammals find the insects, researchers set up a video camera inside a cow shed that was home to a bat colony and lots of bugs. The video showed that bats rely on their echolocation skills to detect flies at a specific time, when they're engaged in rather noisy sex. <laughs> flies are usually quiet in bat territory and sit on cluttered ceilings in caves, where background noise masks the echoes from their movement. But when flies are feeling frisky, males can't help but flutter their wings, emitting a burst of click sounds that the bats pick up on. During more than 1,000 sexual encounters caught in the act on video, 5% of the insects were caught in the act by bats. The research is published in the journal Current Biology. The study shows that ignorance can be safer than carnal knowledge when predators are on the prowl. <laughs> Mosquitoes are an unpleasant fact of summer, but 2012 has been especially bad for running into these irritating insects, because some carry West Nile virus, and they're known to have infected some 2,000 people in 48 states this year. At least 87 people have died from the infection, which can cause swelling in the brain. Almost half the cases have been in Texas, and to lower risk of infection, some areas have taken extreme measures, including aerial pesticide spraying. But people can take some simple measures on their own to reduce their risk. In an essay in Annals of Internal Medicine, public health experts make recommendations. First, simply avoid areas likely to have mosquitoes. And if you can't or don't want to stay indoors, wear long clothes that cover your skin and use insect repellent. Eliminating standing water, such as that pooled in puddles or unused containers, can also help reduce mosquito breeding grounds and populations overall. Stopping the mosquito spread helps in the long run, which is what we have to deal with because scientists say that West Nile virus is, unfortunately, here to stay.
An Arctic storm tore a drilling rig loose from its tow ship and forced it aground near Alaska's Kodiak Island this week. Just a few months ago, the rig and another began preliminary drilling of the first offshore oil wells in the Arctic. Shell's efforts to drill in the Beaufort and Chukchi Seas have been plagued by problems, but that's just part of the cost of doing energy business in this new era. Consider drilling rig operator Transocean, which agreed to pay the U.S. government $1.4 billion this week for its part in the disastrous three-month-long blowout in the Gulf of Mexico in 2010. Meanwhile, the thirst for oil drives the mining of tar sands in Alberta and the flooding of old wells with steam or CO2 in California and Texas. And, of course, there's the accelerating accumulation of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere from all that fossil fuel burning. The resulting climate change is part of what makes drilling for oil offshore in the unfreezing Arctic possible, just as it has opened once mythical shipping routes such as the Northwest and Northeast passages. That's a positive feedback loop with negative consequences. The Curiosity rover has achieved plenty of firsts in its six months on Mars, and the last first is especially noteworthy. On February 9th, NASA announced that Curiosity had made the inaugural run of its drill, boring into a rock to extract a sample from the interior. It thus became the first robot ever to drill on Mars. Curiosity has now gotten some use from most of its science instruments, but not all of them are working. At a conference at UCLA, Deputy Project Scientist Ashwin Vasavada explained that problems are facing the rover's wind and humidity sensors. The humidity sensor is being calibrated. They think it's still going to produce some good data. Uh, it's measuring a good signal. It's just the, the physical units don't quite make sense right now. Worse is the wind sensor, damaged during the rover's landing. The wind sensor is actually six different sensors. We lost two of them during landing, and the other four are proving pretty hard to interpret as well, so we actually have no wind data yet. A few glitches are to be expected. After all, the Curiosity rover, with its unprecedented size and complexity, is a first in and of itself. I think what, what is most remarkable about Dexter is his capacity for stress management. Michael C. Hall, in a conversation about his TV character at the Rubin Museum of Art in New York City on October 24th, he spoke with psychologist Kevin Dutton, author of The Wisdom of Psychopaths. And, and I think that's, that's because of his ability to, as the heat goes up, his... Absolutely internal temperature goes down. Yeah, he, yeah. He, the, the crazier things get, the cooler he feels. He almost craves chaos. He, he seems to attract it, cultivate it, mm. encourage it, because it's the only thing that somehow soothes him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's very realistic, actually, because what you find is it, that the more chaotic a situation, the more that psychopaths have to make decisions under pressure. 
uh, the better their decision making gets and we've seen it with Dexter the more the, the, the pressure builds the cooler he gets and that is exactly what you see with psychopaths it really is When summer hits, I dread jogging outside, but a study finds that elephants can be in true danger in the heat. As creatures get bigger, they have smaller surface area to body volume ratios. Fully grown Asian elephants thus pack a lot of mass into a body with a relatively small surface area, and surface area limits how much body heat you can dissipate. For the study, two female elephants in the Audubon Zoo in New Orleans walked around a half-mile track under various conditions. The outdoor temperature during these sessions ranged from a chilly 8 degrees Celsius to a scorching 35 degrees. Sunny, hot days were the worst. The already limited hide is now itself heated by the sun. With the equivalent of a busted radiator, the elephants retained 56 to 100 percent of their body heat internally, which could make a mere four hours of exercise fatal. The research on elephant exertion is in the Journal of Experimental Biology. Fortunately, elephants have ways to beat the heat, shift activity to after dark, and, of course, go for a dip. Ladybugs love to snack on aphids and other pests, so people began importing an Asian species called the harlequin ladybird as natural pest control. But in their new environments, the harlequins wiped out native ladybugs, and they have their parasites to thank. That's according to research in the journal Science. A parasite called Microsporidia lies dormant in the circulatory systems of harlequin ladybirds. But when scientists injected Microsporidia into a common European ladybug species, the insects died within two weeks. When the ladybugs were injected with dead microsporidia or a control substance, most survived. Harlequin ladybirds' immune systems, on the other hand, have learned to deal with microsporidia, which lets the insects use them as biological weapons, because one way ladybugs compete is by consuming the eggs and larvae of rival species. When European ladybug species eat the harlequin ladybird eggs and larvae, they also consume the microsporidia and die. The discovery demonstrates an important role of immunity in evolutionary selection, and it shows that there are many ways to lose a food fight.